Uh, I said, my name is Jacopo, and I work in Flixbus in Berlin, science now four years. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, some lessons that we learned about uh, using Postgres, or in general, any relational database, in a data science project that is in production. So by production, I mean that we have to process a lot of data. To give you an idea, in peak periods, so not during COVID, but now and before, we have up to five tickets sold per second. Um, we have to process this data at least every day, and it must be fresh. So we have to be sure that we do not see all data, otherwise our results are uh, wrong. Mm, what are we trying to do? Um, essentially, what my team does is we get data from the past, from the past years, and we see how many people did buy a ticket for a given ride between a specific from and to stop, and how much did they pay, and when did they buy the ticket. Given that, we build a model, we train a model, and we use it to predict how many people would like to buy a ticket for every ride in the future, in general in one year uh, in the future, for every specific stop. So as you can imagine, is a lot of data, it's millions of predictions, and we recalculate it every day with different time periods, different models, but essentially it's a lot of data. So we have the problem of performance, of course, because it's a lot of data and can take a lot of time to process. And we have the problem of stability, because as we keep uh, adding more lines, merging with more companies, uh, changing the services, or just changing the infrastructure, we have the schema that keeps changing, so we need to deal with that. And we have to be very careful about outages, because as you can imagine, this kind of prediction, so the prediction of the demand, is what we use to then calculate the price, which means that if we don't calculate it one day, we lose money, uh, pretty much. So it has to be very uh, robust. So today we are, we are going to focus on the database part of it. So not how we do the machine learning, but specifically how we read and write data on the database. We have lots of data, so performance issues may arise. There are many Python libraries that you can use. You have many queries, and you need to keep track of how much time it would take. So uh, is a query stuck? Are they actually running? Are they taking too much time? And we need to deal with schema changes. So you have new tables, new columns, or data that is uh, in a different format. Um, this is going to be very specific for our use case, uh, which means we use a lot of historical data. If you don't, then I probably don't really care. And we have a mostly batch operations, like training and prediction, are generally running uh, in the ground. So you don't really need a specific time. You just care about the overall timing. But we also have some web apps. So we let users, internal users, alter the forecast. So they can specify that a forecast for Sunday is higher or lower than we predicted, because there is maybe uh, a concert, a strike, some event that we just cannot uh, integrate in our model. So humans can actually change it. And that means that we have to provide web apps for that. And this is important, because if we use, for example, a columnar data storage, like uh, Redshift, uh, that's a bit tricky to do. It's possible, but ugly. Uh, so we need also some sort of punctual access and operational access to our uh, system. We use Python because we are at PyCon, and otherwise we would be at another conference. And is because it's essentially the easiest way to do data science at the moment. And Postgres because is is basically that's my opinion, but is based on facts. It's basically the best database that you can have uh, for free. Um, <laughs> It's very, it has a lot of functionality, it's very performant, and it's free open source, it's nice. Um, this is how usually companies do this. You have uh, an operational system, so the system that actually does your business. In our case, is the shop where people buy the ticket. Mm, it can be an app uh, or a website and an app or whatever, but basically this is some system that has a database which is designed for operational usage, which means that you access always you have usually a lot of concurrent connections, and each one reads or writes a very small amount of database, usually it's single row. So you have, a very, you have a sort of rain of continuous small operations. And this is an operational system. You care about very fresh data, of course, but you don't care about historical data. Then you have an ETL, so some operation that runs usually overnight, which reads from the operational system and writes the data into some database, like Redshift or BigQuery or Vertica, if somebody uses that, that is able to um, allow analytical queries in a very uh, fast way. So 
you can easily uh, perform something like a group by or a count on a lot of data uh, fast. And it's not that good for operational access, but that's fine. Also, you can do some transformations. So you can do joins, group by, filters, and get the data in a format that's nicer for analysis and reports and also potentially machine learning. We don't do that for a few reasons. Um, the first is that we need fresh data, so we cannot accept, accept a nightly dump. We did in the past, but now not anymore. We need data that is pretty much real time. And to do that, we use uh, Kafka. So we have, uh, there is a tool called Dibizium, which, in case you don't know, essentially intercepts every operation that happens on a MySQL database and detects every change that happens on the database. And based on that, it generates an event on Kafka. So every time somebody writes or updates a row on the database, you get a Kafka event, which is very simple to parse. So what we do, we read from these Kafka events, and in real time, essentially, we write the same change on our database, which is a Postgres database. Mm, this means that we end up with an exact copy of the monolith database, of the operational database. Mm, the problem with doing that is that um, we essentially cannot do any ETL. We have an exact copy. So we can choose the tables that we want, that we can do. We can choose the columns. We can do some stuff like uh, changing the time zone, but that's it. We cannot do joins because we have independent tables that we don't receive in the same order in which we are created. So we cannot possibly do any uh, operation on that. We can only see an exact copy of the production database. So we do a very simple trivial thing, but very powerful, which is we use materialized views. So in a Postgres, but most relational databases, you can find a view which is just a query with an alias. So when you need to query the same data again and again, you can define a view and say, OK, this long, big query with uh, joins and group bytes and so on as an alias. And you then query that alias instead of the actual query, which means it's nice for the developers. You don't have to see the complexity. So it's like a, a function in Python. You just call it and don't care about the content. But it doesn't do anything for the performance. It, the database is simply replacing your alias with the actual view every time you run it. So it's not faster than just running the, a bigger query. It's just nicer to see. With a materialized view, you essentially ask the database to take a snapshot of what you will see through a query and store it as a physical table. So you can then apply indexes on the table, and accessing it is as fast as accessing uh, any table. But of course, it's a snapshot, so you have to refresh it manually. So we just use it. Uh, this is nothing uh, strange, because you can do in many companies, they do that. And we can have a um, cron job on Kubernetes or just any um, operation to refresh it. The thing that we learned is that if we keep a naming convention so we can associate any materialized view with a corresponding view, we can then easily switch between views and materialized views and ch see the performance between the, the two usages. And essentially, it's much easier to uh, sacrifice um, when needed speed for uh, uh, freshness. So we can always decide whether to use the view or the materialized view, and it's very easy to uh, compare them. Then, OK, we have a problem. Um, the problem is that if we have applications that do a lot of queries and wait a lot of time performing queries, we have to monitor them. And a problem that everyone has at some point is the speed of the application has to be uh, improved, of course. And when that happens, what many people do, and that's a big mistake that every developer do, is instead of profiling the application and knowing how the application spends time, they just imagine something that they decide is the best way to optimize. Think about tail uh, recursion. Now, at some point, it was like the hype, and everyone was doing tail recursion. Now, instead, we want to know how the application is actually spending time. For example, how much does it take to run a query on average? You can always put the query in a database client, run it once, but that's not indicative of how much it takes to run it on actual uh, loads. So our solution is actually multiple steps. The first step is to have a SQL file for each query. This is um, simple, and is a very easy and effective way to keep your query in order. So you don't have strings parsed all around all your application. You don't have, even worse, functions that generate pieces of query that then you compose, because then you have no idea what you're running. You have a folder with SQL files, and every SQL file is a query. This makes a lot easier already to uh, monitor them. You can easily see them. You can edit them. You can do static analysis. So there are tools that can parse a query and tell you 
which tables and columns are being used, so you can do a lot of nice stuff automatically. But then it enables a few nice things that we do. The first is that you can define an helper, which is how you, we actually do queries. So whenever we want to run a query, we simply call this helper and say, okay, run this query, call it in this case get relation popularity. Uh, the name will be get relation popularity dot SQL. We just omit it in the helper. And we pass the parameters. So this is already nice because you don't have much code, you just invoke the query directly. But you can do a few fancy things. The first is that you can retry. So if you get an error, like a network error, or database is down, you just wait a few seconds, retry, and then you have a sort of uh, uh, exponential back off, or whatever logic you want to do. And this is how we can actually upgrade the database. So we have just a Postgres instance on RDS. We sometimes upgrade it. We pass from uh, Postgres 13 to Postgres 14 and so on. This has, has a small uh, downtime. Thanks to this helper and the retry logic that is in it, we have no, um, the, our application keeps running. It just waits and then keeps running. And essentially, we never have to worry about that um, when we run training or prediction. Uh, the second is that we can have some transforming. Uh, this is a just nice thing to have. So if we get a pandas data frame, and since we have uh, data frame that are easily gigabyte of data big, we want to get the exact, uh, um, how to say, the number have to be in an unsigned integer or integer, or basically a specific format, because that means uh, the difference, that makes the difference between crashing or not, because we uh, consume all the memory. And then, and this is actually the point here, we can do profiling. Science this helper is the only place when we run a query, we can always, whenever we run a query, see when it starts, when it ends, and how many times it was executed. So we can easily generate something like this. Uh, you don't have to read all the lines because that's very, very specific. The important thing is the uh, concept. When you run a program, you want to go, you want to build a profile. You want to see how actually it is spending time. And by doing that, by having a simple, a simply, um, a simple helper that invokes every query that runs them, we can easily collect statistics and not on just one execution manually, but every single execution in production. And then we easily build uh, such a thing. So a profile that shows you how the program is spending its time across all the queries and potentially every Python uh, uh, operation. And it's very, it's quite normal that you have uh, a sort of Pareto distribution of the time. So your program spends 80% of the time doing 20% of the queries. So it's better to have this information before optimizing. Mm. Another advantage is that you can detect in advance when a query is taking more time, because if you have a lock or a table is growing, a query can become slower and slower, and you want to detect it before it's so slow that your program crash. You want to see it in advance, so you can use the Datadog or New Relic or whatever and monitor this data in a systematic way. This was all about reading data, which is fine, but then you need also to write data, because if you calculate predictions, you have to write them somewhere. Uh, we write them on Kafka usually, but also on our database. So how do we do millions of rows on in sessions every day in a decent, uh, fast way? There are many options. Uh, assuming you use SQL Alchemy, execute many is probably the bare minimum. It opens a transaction, does a lot of inserts, and closes the transaction, which means it's faster than doing one row per transaction, of course. Mm, but still, you can do better. The best way. Um, by far, in Postgres, is the copy command. Copy essentially gets a CSV of the data and uploads it directly to a table. It's a lot faster than every other option. Um, the problem is that it's very ugly if you have JSON or data types that are very complex to represent. Imagine, uh, for example, PostGIS and ge uh, geometries. And also, the interface is uh, quite ugly. With PsychoBG2, uh, you have to write quite some code, and it's not very user-friendly in case of errors. And in particular, you cannot, uh, oh, you cannot uh, um, deal with upsert. So if you insert data, you want to deal with data that is already there, and you want to specify a logic to merge uh, this data. And copy cannot do that directly. What you can do instead, you can use alloged tables. And alloged table is a Postgres uh, functionality that essentially creates a table which is uh, sacrificing, uh, um, how to say, persistence, so you lose the table if database crashes, so it's not what you want usually. 
but is a lot faster to read and write. It can be easily two, three times faster when you read, write it uh, on an analog table. So you can copy inside the analog table, and then through queries just merge it with the final data that you have. <coughs> then in uh, PsychoPG2, you also have the, this very ugly functionality called execute values, which essentially expects a template for an update or insert. And it unrolls the template, replacing a sort of percentage S that you write yourself with the actual data. So basically, it builds a huge query uh, by repeating values in the query. The problem is that uh, um, it's a bit ugly to see and is impossible to troubleshoot. So basically, when you have an error, you have no idea which columns caused it. You just have to try until it works. Uh, but this, uh, in my measurements, of course, that depends on your data, uh, it was around 20 times faster than just normal insertions. And then my favorite uh, personal option is prepare statements. A prepare statement allows you to send a query to a database, which can be very complex. The database compiles it, and in the recent version of Postgres, this happens through LLVM, so it's very fast. And then you just call the handler for the compiled query by passing parameters again and again. So basically, you can do a lot of insertion, calling the same query again and again in a very effective way. Uh, PsychoPG3 has it as a sort of um, um, first class function is already there, it's nice. And also PsychoPG3 supports the binary protocol, so it can communicate with database, not using text, but uh, sort of byte representation that is much more efficient and compact. Uh, the problem is that PsychoPG3 is not supported yet by SQL Alchemy. SQL Alchemy 2 will support it, but the current SQL Alchemy doesn't. And SQL Alchemy 2 is still not uh, available as a stable. I think not even beta. So that is a future probably, but it's not there. You can do PsychoPG2, but it's ugly as well. And here I wrote an article about um, comparison of these methods and many more. And by the way, I published a slide on Discord, so you can access them. Another trick that we found is that we can simply pre-process data once and store it as file. So when you do training, you reread the same data again and again over time. So it's a bit stupid to redo the same query, to reget the same data that is in the past, so it's not supposed to change. The ride already departed, the tickets are already bought, so it's not different today from tomorrow if it's a ride that was one year ago. So what we do instead, we calculate this data uh, day by day for the past, and we get the result, which is a huge aggregation of everything that we may need, as a file, and we store it on S3, or any actually data storage. Mm, by doing that, you have a huge performance improvement. I actually uh, was very surprised when I saw how fast this can be. We run a comparison, which could be a talk by itself, but basically we run a comparison of every format that we could find. And we found out that Parquet and Arrow is probably the best combination. It's uh, very fast, uh, compressed a lot, and the support on Pandas and Spark is amazing. So essentially, Parquet is a layout that allows for columnar access. So when you create a file or multiple files representing, representing some data, you can later decide which columns you want, and you just read them. So when you read, you can uh, save a lot of time by reading only what you need. Arrow is a bit hard to define, but you can imagine it as, sort of, as a sort of pickle across language. so you, languages. So you just store your data using Arrow, and you can read it back um, without uh, thinking, oh, yeah, I'm using NumPy 120, and I cannot read it because it was pickle in file. No, nothing like that. You just read and write from Java to Python to whatever. Uh, it does actually a, a lot more because it's also a way to represent data in memory but we don't care about that. And then we compress with Snappy, but that's just not the difference from BZ2. And most importantly, uh, with Pandas, it's super trivial to create and to read and write a file in this format. You just install a, a PyArrow, and you, you have a method like save as arrow, I don't remember the name, but basically store uh, as R in this format, and then you read it back. Mm, then, as anticipated, we have the problem of handling the schema changes. Uh, this can be done in many ways. One of the most common is to use SQL Alchemy because it has a migration functionality. Uh, SQL Alchemy is an ORM, so you can, it assumes that you basically want to use the ORM functionality together with the mi migration, which we don't use. So um, it's nice as long as you have uh, a format that plays well with the ORM. It's not nice when you have, for example, uh, uh, user roles and you have grants uh, that we do. Views, you have uh, some complex data types. 
Um, in that case, you have to write them manually, and you basically defeat the purpose of uh, having SQL Alchemy. Then you have Sketch, which is on the other end of the spectrum. Sketch allows you to uh, define all the schema through SQL that you write manually, and you can also write um, functions to check what is the state of the database. So you can just ask Sketch to check the state of the database and apply what's needed. So it's extremely powerful, but you have to write a lot of stuff by hand, which for us is overkill. So what we do instead is a very primitive approach. We have a repository, a Git repository, with a schema.sql file, and that's it. So it's a schema. You get an empty database, you run it, and you get all the structures that you need. Then you have, of course, the problem of finding out what is the difference with the database. So we have this uh, monstrosity. It is actually much more simpler than it looks. It's the, our real make file. And we use two simple tricks. The first is that uh, there is a tool called PG Virtual Env, which can create a sort of on-demand instance, a Postgres instance. And so by doing that, we can create an empty instance and apply our schema to that instance. Then we use PG Dump, which is just the Postgres uh, uh, default way to dump uh, a database, with the option schema only, which only gives you the schema. So by applying PG Dump schema only to our ephemeral database created by PG Virtual Env and to the remote database that is what we actually have, we get two schemas, schematas, depending on what you want to use, and we can just do a textual diff. It's just text. We have a huge blob of SQL, and we just compare them, and we can easily, uh, very easily find out the differences between the schema that is in uh, production or staging and the desired schema. So we avoid having tables that are completely wild and nobody knows how they, that they even exist. Uh, the final trick, I mean, the final for what we <laughs> can fit in a talk, is to use uh, Postgres system tables. So Postgres has a lot of nice uh, tables that tell you everything about what is happening in the database. So how much an index is used, how much a table has uh, sequential, sequential accesses, so access that are slow because there is no index being used, uh, logs, running queries, and so on. And I can suggest this amazing website. I didn't do it, I just found it, which is pgstats.dev, which has this chart of all the tables across versions and what they do and which kind of data they show. So it's really an amazing resource. And the more you learn to use it, the more um, black magic you can do with your Postgres instance. And finally, we are adding. Uh, thanks to COVID now, everyone has a QR reader on their phone. And so if you are interested in this kind of technologies and apply to an actual real problem, which we have a lot of data, real data, that we apply to um, a business-relevant problem, you can apply and ask us. We also have a stand on the third floor, so see. And so you can just reach us to us. If there are questions, this is a good time to ask. <laughs> Uh, so thank you, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. I wonder if someone has questions. If you have questions, you raise your hand, and I will run to you. <laughs> and yes, uh, I don't see questions in Islido, uh, but yeah, we're gonna take offline questions now. Uh, first, thank you for this interesting talk. But uh, I missed the part when you were talking about CDC and coming uh, the stream of events which coming from Kafka, mm -hmm. and then you jumped to using materialized view on Postgres. Is it like you started to store the events in Postgres and then to do the joins on t uh, from multiple streams? Yes. So the, the idea is this: usually you have an ETL, and the ETL doesn't just copy data Z's, but also rearrange it in a way that is nicer for you. In our case, for example, we have distances, which are a bit tricky to calculate. And because a distance can take multiple countries and have different versions, but we don't care about it, we just want the distance. So with an ETL, you can have this calculation done for you. But if we use Kafka, we get fresh data. We have a data basically in real time, but we lose that. We cannot do any ETL. We just have exactly what we have in the production database. So we need some way to perform some sort of mini ETL on the fly. And that's why we use materialized view. 
So basically, my threaded view replaces the operation that an ETL would normally do for you. Okay, so you are storing the events in Postgres and, yep. and then doing the joins in Postgres, but using better materialized view to, uh, to improve the performance um, of the joins. Yes, so we don't store the events as they are. Since every event represents an insert, update, or delete operation, we redo the same operation in our database. So we have an ID, and when we see that something was updated on the monolith database, on the operational database, we apply the same update on our database. Okay, Deletion and insertion are the same. Then my question will be, oh, okay, last question. Okay, last question. So, mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to do this like any using stream processing, like not to no. store it in Postgres and uh, then to do the joins? This is my question. This is my. No, no, you can do some stream processing in Kafka, but by the nature of Kafka, you can always do with Windows. You cannot do with all the data. And on Postgres, it's the opposite. You always see the whole data, and you have to basically refresh the materialized view every time. You can use partitioning, do some magic, but that's essentially it. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Does someone else have a question? I want to give opportunity to his, his <laughs> sorry. I'll be fast. Uh, <laughs> how do you end the locks with the migrations uh, and stuff like that? You say locks? Yeah. Uh, we don't. <laughs> um, well, essentially, when we migrate, we just, as, we just know what we are doing, because that's the database I work with every day. Um, if I've locked, either I wait, because I know that there is a prediction job that is running and I don't want to touch it. Otherwise, there is a function which is pg terminate uh, pid, so you can just ask the database to kill every connection. And you can just terminate everything, and there are no locks. <laughs> uh, one question. Um, so materialized views, they are supposed to be refreshed every time you get new data? Mm, no, uh, that depends on the application. but. Usually, you either do a cron job, so every day at some point you just update it, or every week, or depending on your case. Or if you want, you can basically keep track of what changed in the materialized view. So when there is an update, depending on how often the data changes, and materialize only on demand. That's another thing you can do. That depends on your application. So you basically decide how much to sacrifice speed to access to get uh, um, fresh data. Uh, but are materialized views constrained to only materializing the whole data set? Wouldn't that be a bit? They just materialize a query. So it's like running a query and getting the result into a table. Um, you don't have to uh, apply them on a view. So actually, you can apply them to a query that you run on the fly. But it's, in our case, we just prefer to have a view and a materialized view based on that, like in that case. You can, if you want to get all the recent data, you just put a where in the query and you just get whatever it comes out of that. Does anyone else has questions? So otherwise, I thank you a big applause again <laughs> for the talk. <laughs>